Hey, Bio30, this lesson's going to be on the uh, stress response. We've already talked a little bit about stress, of course, when we did talk about the nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. This is going to tie in the endocrine response as well related to stress. Keeping in mind, there is a very uh, close relationship between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So various different things um, that are stressors in our lives. Uh, many of these things are physical stress. It can be physical like uh, exercise, physical stress like injury as well, all kinds of psychological and emotional stress, stress in relationships, stressors in your life like uh, pregnancy and someone new coming into a family, someone dying in a family, things related to school, things related to your job, lack of sleep, fear of course is going to be a big stressor as well. Doesn't really matter what the kind of stress is though, your body really doesn't distinguish between the different kinds of stress and it does respond in the same way. So again, some of this we have seen before. So over at the right hand side, we do have the sympathetic nervous system and the nervous system responses associated with that. That does of course come from the central nervous system, higher brain centers in the central nervous system working through the hypothalamus. And as we already saw, the sympathetic nervous system responses, whole bunch of things, a uh, fight or flight response that are preparing your body to either deal with that situation or get out of that situation. So for the most part, if we do take a look at uh, what we're seeing here with some of these sympathetic nervous system responses, what we're seeing is activating those parts of your body that allow you to deal with the stressors and kind of shutting down those ones that are not necessary in a stress situation. So things that we did see before, kind of big ones like increasing your heart rate, increasing your breathing rate, dilating or relaxing your airway passages, your bronchi, in order to bring more air in, dilating your pupils to take in more information, and other things that we're not all that terribly concerned about during a stress situation. So not all that terribly concerned about digestion, so that's going to drop, inhibit salivation, inhibition, in peristalsis and the secretion of digestive enzymes and also inhibit uh, urination, urinary bladder contractions. A couple of other ones here that we didn't really stress too much when we did talk about the nervous system response and that is related to glucose, increasing blood glucose and making that available to your cells. And also this one here, this one in fact is going to be one of the portions of the endocrine response related to stress that we're going to talk about and that's going to be mediated through, as we will see, the sympathetic nervous system. So going back to the previous slide here, so all of those ones, that is the sympathetic nervous system, nervous system response, and that one that I did mention right at the end, the adrenal glands and the production of a hormone by the adrenal medulla in particular, which is epinephrine. So epinephrine is a major stress hormone. It is a hormone that is produced by the adrenal medulla. And what the adrenal medulla um, receives in order to produce that hormone is the sympathetic nervous system message that's coming directly from the central nervous system. So if we do take a look at this picture that I have in the middle here, we can see that the adrenal glands, they do sit on top of the kidneys and the adrenal gland is kind of divided into two different parts. The one that we see on the right hand side of this diagram dealing with the adrenal medulla is the inner portion. Inner portion of the adrenal gland, and that is the adrenal medulla, and it is that portion that is going to be producing the epinephrine. So once again, why the adrenal medulla is producing the epinephrine is because of neurons, because of stimulation, coming from the sympathetic nervous system. On the left hand side of this diagram we have something else that's taking place, the production of another stress hormone and this other stress hormone at the bottom that's produced by the adrenal cortex in this case is going to be a cortisol, at least that's the major one that we talk about, is the cortisol. So cortisol produced by the adrenal cortex, the cortex is the outer part of the adrenal gland and the adrenal cortex is one of those portions in the body, one of the very few, that is producing steroid hormones. So cortisol is a steroid hormone 
as opposed to epinephrine, which is a protein hormone. In order to get the cortisol being produced, the adrenal cortex is not directly stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. Instead, if we go back up to the top, higher brain centers again are going to influence the hypothalamus and they're going to tell the hypothalamus to produce a tropic hormone. And this tropic hormone is a releasing hormone that goes by the name of adrenal corticotropic hormone releasing hormone, or sometimes just more simply, corticotropic releasing hormone. So if I write the abbreviations for those, ACTH and then the RH for releasing hormone. Again, this is adrenal corticotropic hormone releasing hormone. The other name that it goes by is simply corticotropic releasing hormone or CRH. They are one in the same thing. They really only do one thing. They are produced by the hypothalamus and they target the anterior pituitary, a tropic hormone that tells the anterior pituitary to in turn produce a second tropic hormone, which happens to be ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. This hormone, as the name implies, adrenal cortico deals with the adrenal cortex. It is a tropic hormone, so in itself, it really doesn't have any function other than to tell another gland to produce another hormone. And that's exactly what this hormone does. It tells the adrenal cortex to produce the hormone cortisol. All of these are kind of taking place at the same time. The sympathetic nervous system response and all of those effects that we saw directly associated with the sympathetic nervous system are extremely rapid. So even if we just take a look at something like the heart rate, it is almost immediate. The impulse, the message coming from the sympathetic nervous system going to the heart, leading to an increase in heart rate. The sympathetic nervous system stimulating the adrenal medulla, producing the epinephrine, will also increase the heart rate. But now we have to have this hormone being produced, released into the blood, circulating around, finding its target, the heart cells, and increasing the rate of contraction. So although it might be doing the same thing, it takes a little bit longer than the nervous system, strictly the sympathetic nervous system response. Everything kind of on the right hand side here, all of these that I will circle, all of this is sometimes referred to as the short term stress response. It allows your body to, well, deal with short term stress. If you are dealing with stress for a prolonged period of time, so it might be over tens of minutes or hours, or even much longer than that, days or weeks, then this one here more so comes into play. So this is often referred to as the long-term stress response. And it takes a little bit longer. So we saw with the epinephrine, it takes longer than the sympathetic nervous system response because it does involve the release of a hormone. On the left-hand side, of course, now we have the sequence of three different hormones, three different glands that are involved to get the eventual production of the cortisol. And uh, that one does take a little bit longer as well. So these two hormones, uh, in terms of their effects, their responses, in some cases, as we'll see, they're going to be similar. And in other cases, there will be some uh, slight differences between them. And also between epinephrine, the adrenal medulla hormone, and the sympathetic nervous system, many of the responses are really going to be supporting each other. So epinephrine, enhancing the responses, in many cases that we already see, that were the result of the sympathetic nervous system. This one here, just showing a few more details of what we already did talk about. In this picture here, it's kind of flipped around right to left, what we saw on the previous one. So the left-hand side is where we do have, in this picture, the short-term stress response. So that means the hormone that we are going to have at the bottom here is going to be the epinephrine. epinephrine that's produced by the middle part of the adrenal gland, which again is the adrenal medulla. So why it is produced again, we can see very clearly in this picture. So we do have neurons that are extending all the way from the brain. So this neuron here is going to be part of the sympathetic nervous system. 
This neuron here is part of the sympathetic nervous system. So those messages coming directly from the brain, directly from the hypothalamus, in response to whatever the stressor happens to be. At the same time, again, albeit a little bit slower, on the right-hand side, we have the long-term stress response. So in this case, the releasing hormone, and keep in mind that whenever we do see releasing hormones, RH, what we're really talking about are hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus, and they are influencing the anterior pituitary. So you do need to distinguish between the anterior and posterior pituitary. This is most definitely the anterior pituitary. And whenever you see releasing hormone, it is going to be a hormone produced by the hypothalamus that is targeting uh, the anterior pituitary. So here it just says releasing hormone, but as we just talked about, what that hormone is actually going to be is the adrenal corticotropic hormone releasing hormone, or here I'll just put it as the CRH corticotropic releasing hormone. That one is going to find its target in the anterior pituitary, leading to the production and release of our second tropic hormone, the ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, that circulates to the blood, through the blood until it finds its one and only one target, the middle part, or sorry, the outer part of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex in this case, and that's going to lead to the production of one of the steroid hormones, the one that I mentioned, which is the cortisol. So the last couple slides, we'll just take a look at a couple of the effects that we do see. So this one here is dealing with the short-term stress response. So here they identified that hormone that I mentioned, the epinephrine. They also have another one here, kind of similar in its structure, kind of similar in its function, minor differences between the two of them, and these subtle differences you don't really need to know for the purposes of biology 30. So what are some of the effects of the epinephrine? Well, it is a stress situation. Your body is going to need a fuel, so you're going to break down the storage form of fuel, which is glycogen, into glucose, and that is the fuel that your cells can then use for the process of cellular respiration. So it breaks down that storage form, and it also releases it into the blood to increase the blood glucose. And we can see other ones here, increased blood pressure, increased breathing rate along with the sympathetic nervous system response, which is the same, increased metabolic rate, change in blood flow pattern, so where you want to have the blood going is to those cells and tissues that are going to allow you to deal with the stress, so your skeletal muscles and to your heart and to your brain as well, increasing alertness in order to prepare and deal with that stress, and again, kind of uh, shutting off for the most part, the blood flow going to the non-essential organs and cells, so that includes the digestive system, the excretory system, and the reproductive system. For the long-term stress response, so I did mention cortisol as being the major hormone. Cortisol is one of what are referred to as glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids, corticoids, hormones produced by the adrenal cortex. Gluco really just saying that it has something to do with glucose and regulating glu glucose in your body, of which there are many hormones that do that including, of course, the one that we just mentioned, the epinephrine. So what can this cortisol do? This is for now a long-term stress, so your body may be running out of those carbohydrate storage reserves, the glycogen, and now you need to use some other sources for fuel. So your body will begin to break down things like proteins and fats and use those as an energy source. And also this one here, suppression of the immune system. So we saw that we're kind of toning down what's going on with the digestive system, the reproductive system, the excretory system, and kind of the same with the immune system, allowing you to better deal with that stress at hand. This other one that is mentioned here, middle corticoids, this is referring to um, a different hormone, one that uh, we had already talked about, which is aldosterone, and some of the effects associated with that related to sodium reabsorption. So to summarize all of this and talk a little bit about the feedback, um, so we will, of course, have the stress. That is our stimulus. Okay, stress is the stimulus. 
we have three different glands that are involved. They are the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and the adrenal cortex, three different glands. We have three different hormones. This is our first hormone here, the releasing hormone produced by the hypothalamus. This is our second hormone here, the tropic hormone ACTH produced by the anterior pituitary. And in this picture, this yellow region here is going to be the anterior pituitary. And the final hormone that we have, the one that actually has the effect on cells throughout the body, the glucocorticoid cortisol. So that cortisol is then going to, of course, lead to the responses that we saw on the previous page, maintaining blood pressure, maintaining blood glucose. Those are some of the effects of the cortisol. And finally, once there is a sufficient amount of that cortisol circulating around, keep in mind all of this does have to do with maintaining homeostasis. So once there is a sufficient amount that is circulating around and it reaches a high enough concentration, there will be receptors that we do have on the hypothalamus and receptors that we do have on the pituitary as well, the anterior pituitary. And that cortisol, which is circulating around, that will bind to the target cells and lead to a response, is also going to feed back and bind to receptors in the anterior pituitary and in the hypothalamus. And what it's going to do is have the negative feedback. So remember what that means is it's going to turn off any further production of the cortisol. The final hormone, cortisol in this case, is regulating its own production. It is saying to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus, that is enough. There is enough cortisol circulating around. We don't need any more. So negative feedback will then decrease the production of the releasing hormone, which in turn will decrease the production of the ACTH. And of course, the negative feedback here will do the same thing. And both of those together are going to decrease the production of the final hormone, which is going to be the cortisol.